Well, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our second session on new research on greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sequestration in lower Fraser Valley agricultural systems. Today is part two and we're focusing on blueberry production. If you missed last week's session on vegetables, we will share the recording link in the chat in just a second. I am Shauna McKinnon, coordinator for the BC Agricultural Climate Adaptation Research Network, and I have the pleasure of hosting today's session. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting the session from Vancouver, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish, Salatooth, and Musqueam nations. And we have people joining us today from many parts of BC and beyond. Thank you for making the time after the long weekend to join us. Um, I encourage everyone to take a second to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're calling in from and why you've joined today. Um, please direct your messages to panelists and attendees and not just to the panelists. Uh, to give you an overview of what we're discussing in the next hour, we have five presenters for you. They will be introducing you to the Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Program project led by the University of British Columbia and they'll be sharing results from field research, as well as providing an overview of BMP options for blueberry production to reduce GHG emissions and sequester carbon. We will have a short Q&A after each of our presenters and time for a longer Q&A at the end of the session. As people are presenting, you can type your questions into the Q&A box, which you can find in your Zoom control panel. I encourage you to start entering your questions as they come to you and as presenters are speaking. Um, and because we have multiple speakers today, if you could type in the name of the person you're directing your question to into the question, that will help us um, and make sure that the question is directed to the right speaker and help us loop back to those unanswered questions when we get to the end of the session. We also have an upvote option in the Q&A box. And so you can see that there's a little thumbs up icon next to a question that someone's entered. And if you would like to see that question answered um, as a priority question, then just click that thumbs up icon and it'll rise to the top of the queue and we will um, take those questions first. Okay, well, let's get going. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Andy Black, professor in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems and lead of the Biometeorology and Soil Physics Group at UBC. Dr. Black will be providing an overview of the Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Program project um, that he's been leading for the last four years. So Andy, I'll hand it over to you now. Uh, thank you, Shauna. And uh, hi, everyone. Nice to have you with us in, on this webinar. In 2017, our team were given funds as part of AGGP to quantify and mitigate greenhouse gas emissions from high value crops in the lower Fraser Valley. Uh, one of those crops is blueberries, which is what we're talking about today. This is Canada is the second largest producer of blueberries in the world, second to the US. BC produces over 90% of Canadian high bush blueberries. The area in BC blueberry production has been steadily increasing, as you can see from this graph. Conventional management typically uses re uh, regular application of sawdust to prevent weeds, conserve moisture, and, and increase, soil, uh, uh, increase soil organic matter. The high CN ratio, carbon to nitrogen ratio of sawdust, can lead to nitrogen immobilization during its decomposition. So farmers tend to apply a, a little more N fertilizer. And the question becomes, how do, we, how do measured annual N2O emissions that we've been doing during this research compare to tier one and tier two estimates? And a follow-up, a very important question, is what are the carbon and GHG budgets of blueberry fields with this kind of management. And Pat will be talking about that in his talk. Many soils in the lower Fraser Valley have poor drainage due to, due to soil texture and site elevation. High soil moisture can lead to reducing conditions. That means low, low oxygen levels leading to more denitrification and hence more N2O emissions. How big is this effect? How do different drainage management practices affect GHG emissions? And Paula will be addressing that in her talk. Nutrient management also plays a very important role in controlling GHG emissions. This is a photo of, a, of an experimental layout at the Agassiz Research and Development Center. It's a, an experiment designed by Shabtai and, and his colleague, uh, Dr. Derek Hunt. And this was a site visit. So uh, we'll be hearing more about this from Shabtai in his talk. 
And finally, from Sean, we will hear about what we're really interested in, I guess, is that the, the beneficial management practices based on all this research that can be recommended to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and at the same time, increase carbon sequestration. Thank you very much, everyone. Back, back to you, Shauna. Great, thank you so much, Andy, for providing the context of the project as well as the upcoming presentations. And now I'll introduce Patrick Pau. He's a PhD student in soil science at UBC, working under the supervision of Dr. Andy Black. And Patrick will be sharing results on carbon sequestration and the GHD budget of Highbush Blueberry in Delta. Um, welcome, Patrick, and go ahead. Right, thank you, yeah, thanks for the introduction. China. And yeah, so as mentioned today, we're going to be talking a little bit about our research in terms of the greenhouse gas exchange above this blueberry field. And so to start, oh, here we go. Yeah. And to start, uh, first, we're going to talk about, well, why are we even uh, considering blueberry fields and what are the implications for uh, greenhouse gas emissions? So first of all, if you take a look at this photo, you can see that like this is a like a sort of a, a semi-typical blueberry field. You see that first that there is this sawdust uh, sawdust mounding, right? So the surface has been amended with sawdust, meaning that we're adding a lot of carbon to the system. Uh, second, uh, during uh, multiple times of the year, this blueberry field will actually be fertilized. So they're also adding, in addition to the carbon, they're also adding additional nitrogen. And finally, you'll see that there's also actually this grass intero. Now, not all the fields in the lower Fraser Valley will have a grass intero, but the, for the fields that do have this grass intero, um, now you're having to also consider uh, the exchange of uh, CO2 that's also being photosynthesized uh, from this grass intro. So we have these, um, all these sort of systems sort of playing together that will eventually affect um, the GHG emissions of this field. And so this is sort of what the system that we had set up into the blueberry field is. And you'll notice it looks kind of compact, it looks kind of messy, but the reason for sort of us jamming all this instrumentation in the middle of the field is because if you look now on, uh, on the left, we are not actually intruding into the field, right? One of the benefits of what we're doing is that by, put, by placing all of our instrumentation sort of directly in the field, we don't actually have to intrude into the field because we're just measuring uh, the greenhouse gas exchange above it, right? Another benefit of the way we're doing things is that the measurement will become continuous. I don't have to be there to measure it. You can see from all the computers and things, um, this instrumentation is sort of set into the field and it's going to measure things continuously. You can actually see kind of if you zoom in a little bit that I'm actually measuring the fluxes, you can see the lines uh, continuously going. And then the last thing, one of the major benefits of the things that we're doing is that this is a field scale level measurement. So uh, from this field, this is the blueberry field that we're measuring. Sort of this area, you can see kind of the scale here is, is over hundred meters. This is the field we're measuring. And sort of this yellow area, this entire yellow area is predominantly where we're measuring the fluxes from. So we're measuring greenhouse gas fluxes, predominantly they're coming from this large area and we're directly in the middle of the field. So that's sort of, uh, I know we're, we're I'm kind of going quickly here, but I'm just trying to give a sort of context into what we're measuring. We're measuring from inside the field over this uh, yellow area-ish. And so another, uh, just to briefly go over the site as well, uh, we were uh, hosted, we had the pleasure to be hosted by MLA Farms. Uh, the, the, this is the, the uh, blueberry species, the cultivars were Rika and Duke. Um, it was a Westham and Crescent soil series, so uh, silk clay loam or a silt loam. And it was moderately well to well drained with subsurface drain tiles. And it's not really typical as you, you might've seen earlier from Andy's earlier photo, not all the fields are, are drained very well, but this one, is uh, moderately well to well drained because of those drain tiles. Uh, in 2018, which was the study year, it was fertilized with about 110 kilograms of N per hectare with ammonium sulfate. And uh, that year as well, it was uh, harvested with about 11,000 11, kilograms of hectare of blueberries for fresh weight. So this would be considered a, a good yield for that year. And so after that context, and now I'm going to show um, sort of the final results from our, uh, from our study. And uh, in terms of the greenhouse gas fluxes, so I'm about to show a bunch of figures. And when you see a positive number, a positive number will indicate that um, what I'm showing on the graph means that the field is a source for that greenhouse gas. And uh, if it's a negative number, it means it's being sequestered or it's a, it's a sink for that greenhouse gas. So the panels are gonna be CO2, nitrous oxide and methane, which are the three greenhouse gases we measured. So in the first, first panel, you can see this is CO2. 
And it takes sort of like a, you don't have to worry too much about the units. You more so worry about, um, you know, whether it's basically positive or negative. And you can see that it takes sort of a typical, uh, typical shape and that is mostly a source during the shoulder months and the winter, right? But then it starts slowly becoming a sink, which is what we'd expect because as the plants sort of progress uh, through, their, uh, through their life stages, they, they start leafing out, there's bud burst, and then they start sequestering more and more carbon. But you'll notice that um, it's not taking its regular shape. Usually it would sort of have this bell shape that kind of extends down. But you can see that it sort of like becomes a source periodically throughout the season. And that's because of that intero, in that grass intero I mentioned earlier. They're periodically mowing the field. And when they mow the field, it actually reduces uh, the amount of carbon that can be sequestered from that field, which is really interesting because like we're talking about blueberry fields, but if you have a grass intero, that grass intero, depending on how much you mow it, will, will actually affect the overall greenhouse gas balance of that field, which is really interesting. Uh, so that's for CO2. The second thing, the second panel would be uh, nitrous oxide. So you can kind of see that there's this sort of overwinter um, steady state where it's consistently relatively low fluxes, but then uh, when the growing season starts, the field is fertilized and you can see these peaks that are, um, uh, that are related to those uh, fertilization events. And then it kind of goes back down to sort of its pre-winter condition, but then all of a sudden it sort of spikes again really quickly. And so uh, it's very interesting that um, the nitrous oxide fluxes are uh, predominantly controlled by the fertilization, but also the sudden onset of fall precipitation. And you can kind of see in this second, uh, this, this third peak here. And then it, that, that peak extends for a very long time, even though the field is not being fertilized throughout these, you know, these four months. So it's very interesting to see that it's not only just the fertilization, the addition of nitrogen that's causing the uh, nitrous oxide to peak, but also like the, the climate as well. And then lastly, we also measured methane, but there, uh, there wasn't uh, anything too, too special with methane. Um, if you, if considering the units, this is actually very small. And so the methane from our study did not really uh, impact the net GHG balance or the net uh, carbon balance, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. And so if you take sort of these, these are the, the, the fluxes that we measured every day. If you take those and you, you sort of add them up. Uh, and so this is what I'm doing. I'm just adding up all the, uh, the, uh, the fluxes that we measured. So the top one is again, uh, carbon, nitrogen, and uh, methane. And you can see if I just add them all up uh, at the end of the year, uh, at the end of the year, we get about 1.7 tons of carbon per hectare as a source. So again, if the number is positive, that means it's a source, meaning that, uh, yeah, we're emitting about 1.7 tons of just carbon from CO2 from that field. Uh, and again, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll talk about this a little bit later when I talk about the carbon balance. And then for the second panel, we can see the, uh, the nitrous oxide emission. So you can kind of see that it extends all the way up to uh, here, 3.9 kilograms of N per hectare. And I have these two arrows here, and those indicate the tier one and tier two estimates. So we didn't really um, explain it that, uh, that much earlier, but the tier one and tier two estimates are sort of like the progressively complex uh, estimates of what uh, the emission from nitrous oxide should be based off basically how much you're applying. So if we take those estimates that uh, we're using based off how much we're applying, we would get that we should be uh, emitting about 2.1 or 2.6, right? But what we actually find is we're actually measuring, you know, 3.9. So a lot higher than, than what was predicted. And you can kind of also see that based off where this uh, red arrow is here, we're basically able to capture all the emissions up until September. Right, so like the 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 the, uh, the emission estimates tier one and tier tier, they're basically good up until September, but it doesn't really have the, the estimates that we currently have or the ways that we have to estimate the the cumulative nitrous oxide emission. They don't really work sort of past that, and they're not able to capture sort of if I kind of go back up, they're not able to capture this second sort of series of pulses associated with the fall precipitation. So that's kind of interesting. Well, that it works basically right up until this point. And then there isn't really anything in the, the equations to estimate what happens uh, in the second half of the year. And then uh, uh, finally, I also included a, a methane just for completion, but you can see from the, the units that um, it, it's very negligible, right? Like we're talking like uh, hundreds, 200 grams of carbon uh, per meter squared. And here we're, we're, we're in the zero, zero to 0.5 to one. So very small amounts of carbon. And, and again, don't, don't worry about too much about the actual numbers in the middle, but I just kind of want to draw your attention in this table to what the values are at the end. 
right? So we have uh, about, if we add up uh, those greenhouse gases and we add up um, the total amount and we weight each greenhouse gas from its global warming potential, I, get, I think some of my colleagues are going to explain that a little bit later, we get that we're emitting about 628 grams of CO2 uh, equivalents in, in, in CO2, 182 in nitrous oxide, and uh, 30, resulting in a grand total of about 840. And this is really interesting because uh, uh, if we remember last week, last week uh, we were talking about vegetable production and my colleague presented a um, case study with uh, potatoes, a uh, potato rotation. And they were getting that, um, it was emitting about uh, 480 or 200, depending on uh, what, what, what was on the field. And in their study, CO2 was actually a sink that was dominated by high N2O emissions. But, ours, but in our study, it's actually the opposite. Um, our CO2 is actually a strong source and it's actually not controlled by nitrous oxide emissions, but it's predominantly still controlled uh, by the carbon emissions. So, so what's happening with the, the carbon emissions? We partitioned um, the carbon to try to separate out, um, you know, uh, is it really the photosynthesis? Is it the respiration? And in doing so, we actually find that um, despite matching, uh, the respiration does match the photosynthesis, which would be the green line here, but it does extend and go and beyond and surpasses the photosynthesis, especially in the shoulder seasons and over the winter. And that's probably related to the sawdust application, which is something we, we don't necessarily have too much time to discuss, but yeah, it is related to the sawdust applications. Um, because we are importing a bunch of sawdust though, however, it makes the carbon balance a little different because I'm able to calculate how much is sequestered based off what we measure. So this NEP number would be what we measure um, in terms of gases flux. And then the input of the sawdust would be, you know, how much carbon we put in. And then we also subtract how much carbon uh, is in the fruit. And so I'm just flying along here. This is what we measured uh, from the tower. This is how much we're estimating goes in from the carbon from the sawdust. And then I also subtract how much is coming off as the fruit. And if you total all those things up, you'll actually notice that you're importing a lot of carbon. So if you're adding carbon every year, you're actually importing a lot of carbon to the field and it actually completely reverses it. The field is actually sequestering about 2.3 tons. So it goes from emitting about approximately two tons to sequestering about two tons because you're actually putting on twice the amount every year that you're actually uh, emitting. So that's kind of interesting. It, the field is a source, it's emitting carbon, but if you include how much sawdust you're putting in, it's actually sequestering carbon. And so in conclusion, year round measurements determined that the field was a net greenhouse gas source. The field emitted about 840 uh, grams of CO2E per meter square per year. And it was actually dominated by high CO2 emission. N2O and methane emissions contributed approximately 21 and 3.5% respectively. Mowing the grass intro decreased the sea strength of the field during the growing season. Elevated N2O emissions were associated with the fertilization and fall precipitation. Cumulative N2O emissions were higher than predicted by tier one and tier two estimates. And finally, the field lost 1.7 tons of carbon per year from only the CO2 emissions. But if you include how much sawdust you're putting in and, and you know how much carbon you're taking out from the blueberries, the field is actually gaining about 2.3 tons of carbon per hectare per year. And so, uh, I would just like to acknowledge uh, all the support that we received and especially from the husband family who was kind enough to host us and host our research site. And finally, I just have a, a, a slide uh, for questions. And this is, our, uh, this is our lab group at the time. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. That was a really interesting look at what's happening in blueberry fields. We do have a few questions for you and uh, two of them are about grass. So I'm gonna combine them Let's and see. The question is around um, mowing and how are the fields, or how is mowing um, contributing mm -hmm. to the carbon source? Yeah, yeah, could that's a that's a great question. Yeah. The follow-up question to that is, what could you do differently to reduce mm -hmm. the amount of carbon that's being released? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Okay, so um, to, to to answer the first one, what is it about uh, mowing the 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 that makes the field a carbon source? And so yes, yeah, so that, that like I should I should have probably mentioned the grass predominantly the grass is being left on the field. So like the clippings, the prunings, everything is left on the field. But uh, another thing that is also um, happening is that um, the, 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 uh, in terms of how much grass is on the field, when you, it, it, is at, it is photosynthesizing at a certain rate that's based off sort of the leaf area of that field. So when the grass, um, before it's cut, it's basically at its like maximal leaf area. And so it's able to photosynthesize the most it's able to. But, but the second you cut the field, you have approximately the same amount of respiration but then you've uh, reduced how much 
um, can be photosynthesized because uh, uh, you've, you've cut all the grass and there's no leaf area for photosynthesis. So that's like one of the reasons why um, it turns into a source after. It's not necessarily the fact that um, you're leaving a bunch of the clippings. That is related and that will increase it, but it's more so the fact that you, you will have about the same amount of respiration, but then all of a sudden uh, significantly reduced uptake of C. So that's, uh, that's, that's to answer sort of the first question. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, so the follow up was how could you handle it differently to, oh, okay. Yeah. That's, 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 yeah, that's a good question. We, we were sort of, um, having the idea that you could probably reduce the amount that you cut the grass by. Like, I, I know it's, I know that's kind of, um, difficult and that doesn't necessarily, it's not really, um, like something that's necessarily concrete, but what we sort of establish is that if you don't cut the grass like straight to the bone, like you don't cut it all the way to the ground, you actually leave a little bit uh, on top, then it, the, the grass will actually regenerate much quicker. And you'll see, and uh, you kind of see in the, the figures that um, it took varying amounts of time for the grass to like rebound and become a sink again, right? And it kind of, kind of depends on basically who's cutting the grass. If they cut the grass like basically to the bone every single time, then it takes a lot longer for the grass to sort of regrow its leaf area and then start sequestering again. But at the same time, then you have to also consider, you know, how many times you have to cut it, right? Because if you, if you don't cut it all the way down, then you have to like, you have to start thinking about, you know, like how many lawnmower hours you're putting and that sort of thing. So that's, that's something that's maybe not necessarily too, um, we would have to do a couple more studies on that to figure out like how much you should cut the grass basically. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much for um, providing some more insight into to the yeah. grass management. Um, I'll answer uh, the rest of the questions uh, in the chat directly. Yeah, there are a couple more questions in there. You can um, just answer them by type. And if you do have further questions for Patrick, feel free to put them into the Q&A. He can answer them. And uh, Patrick, I'll ask if you sure. yeah. And now I will introduce Paula Porto. Um, Paula, Paula is an MSc student in soil science at UBC, working under the supervision of Dr. Sean Smuckler. And Paula will be sharing results on the effect of drainage management and soil hydrology on soil greenhouse gas fluxes, again, focusing on blue areas. Thank you, Paula. It's great to have you presenting today. Thanks, Shauna. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Today, I'm going to talk about like Shauna said, the effect of soil drainage on soil greenhouse gas fluxes from high bush blueberry fields in Delta BC. Um, so how does water impact soil greenhouse gas emissions? We know that microbes and roots produce greenhouse gases in the soil when they respire and that there is a, a whole range of factors that influence the magnitude and the timing of these emissions. But water is an important one because it impacts nutrient transport um, and the type of biological respiration that takes place. So when the soil is saturated, its pores are filled with water instead of air. So anaerobic respiration takes place, which leads to the production of nitrous oxide and methane. And when the soil is unsaturated, there's more air in its, por in its pores. So aerobic respiration takes place, which produces carbon dioxide. And well aerated soils also uh, can consume methane. Um, but these are just general trends. Uh, the real world's a bit more complex. And you can see from this graph here showing nitrous oxide emissions over soil water content, that the general trend is that total nitrous oxide production increases with soil water content, but there are different pathways that lead to nitrous oxide production and they reach peak rates at different soil water contents. So knowing this, um, and as Andy mentioned in the beginning, how, um, in Delta, we receive a lot of water and a majority of farmers use some sort of drainage to deal with this excess water. Um, we wanted to know how drainage and other soil and environmental variables impact greenhouse gas emissions and whether we can recommend a beneficial drainage management practice that mitigates greenhouse gas emissions. So to answer these questions, I observed a total of nine blueberry farms with different drainage management systems, all in Delta. Um, so I had fields that had no subsurface drainage tiles, but that use subsoiling and surface drainage channels to deal with excess water in their fields. And then I had farms that had subsurface drainage tiles with and without ditch pumps. And in each of these fields, I measured soil greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide every two weeks for two years from 2017 to 2019 using a portable FTIR analyzer and manual chambers. 
And I also collected ancillary environmental data, such as soil water content and depth to water table. Um, and then after doing all this, I used the principal component analysis to group the fields into two distinct hydrology categories. And to do this, I used uh, these two variables, so depth to water table and soil water content measured as volumetric uh, water content at the surface. Um, and thankfully, I was able to create two distinct groups, high water table and low water table, each with three fields. So in this slide, I'm just showing soil drainage indicators for those two variables that I talked about. So I have water table depth over time and volumetric water content at the surface over time. And the high water table group is represented by dark blue. And as you can see, um, generally it has uh, the higher water table and also a higher volumetric water content. Um, and so these, the fields in these group are wetter than the ones in the low water table group. Well, let's talk greenhouse gases. Uh, I know this slide is a little bit busy, but bear with me. So at the top here, I have um, daily CO2 fluxes and kilograms of CO2 per hectare per day. Then I have nitrous oxide, methane, and some climate variables here at the bottom. So in the dark gray, I have average weekly temperature and the light gray bars represent total weekly precipitation. And uh, these gray bands here, I forgot to mention in the last graph, they're showing the growing season from April to the end of September. So if we focus here on the top, we can see that CO2 sort of follows the same trend as the average weekly temperature line. Um, emissions are highest in the growing season and lowest in the winter months. And you can see that the high water table group either matches or has higher daily fluxes than the low water table group. For nitrous oxide, we get a few spikes in the fall and the winter. Same for methane um, with this relatively higher uh, spike um, in comparison to the rest. And I'm just going to change the scale here and zoom in a bit. So I'm actually just zooming in uh, beyond those spikes. And you can see here that we get some smaller uh, spikes for nitrous oxide from April to June, which is when the farmers apply uh, nitrogen fertilizers. And for methane, there's some consumption and some other spikes of emissions, but in general, uh, the fluxes average around zero. So in this slide, I'm showing cumulative emissions by season. And I have year one in the top row and year two at the bottom. And the color coding is the same. So for carbon dioxide, we can see that the patterns are the same across the seasons and for the two years. The high water table group emitted more carbon dioxide than the low water table group, but a group effect was only significant in the spring of both years. For nitrous oxide, the patterns are similar. The high water table group tends to emit more than the low water table group, except for the summer. And um, we have varying levels of group of a significant group effect in the fall and winter of both years. And then for methane, um, we can see that in the winter of year two, emissions sort of stand out, but with high variability. And again, when I uh, zoom in. Um, so I'm just changing the scale here again. Uh, you can see that the patterns are not super consistent across the seasons and for the two years. So there's more variability with this gas. And then in this slide, I'm showing cumulative emissions by year with year one at the top again and year two at the bottom. And uh, for carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, it follows the same trend with the high water table group emitting more um, and with a significant um, group effect in the year two for carbon dioxide and in both years for nitrous oxide. And then for methane, there was no significant group effect, um, but we see that in year one, the fields on average consumed methane, but in year two, they actually emitted methane. So um, in conclusion, my study indicates that poorly drained fields emit more carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide 
um, than better drained fields. And that on average each year, the high water table group emits 27% more CO2 and 146% more nitrous oxide than the low water table group, which indicates that uh, effective artificial drainage has the potential to reduce soil emissions. However, more research is needed to understand the impact of soil drainage. We'd like to know if the patterns are consistent across different soil types and climatic regions. Um, and it would be interesting to do a full greenhouse gas budget for um, this agroecosystem, looking at fields that have uh, poor drainage and fields that are well drained. And then for next steps, I will analyze the impact of other variables on soil emissions, such as the thickness of the sawdust mulch. Uh, at the bottom here, I have a photo of sawdust hill. This is a sawdust mound in one of the fields that I sampled. Uh, like Andy mentioned, it's commonly applied to the crop row. And then I will also use the process-based denitrification decomposition model to simulate soil emissions from high bush blueberry fields. And if it uh, performs well, hopefully we can use it to simul simulate the impact of other management practices. Uh, so I'd like to thank our funder, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and everyone that's helped me get here. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Paula. It's really important to be looking at how water and drainage are impacting emissions in this region. Um, I don't have any questions yet in the Q&A, so please uh, type in your questions for Paula. Um, maybe while we're waiting for people to get in their questions, uh, you can stop sharing your screen now. And um, Shabtai, you can, oh, actually, I'm going to get you to answer a question. Um, Shabtai, you know you're on deck next. So Paula, um, by what mechanism would carbon dioxide increase in wetter conditions if it's not forward with respiration? Yeah, that's a great question. That's something that um, I actually need to look into because it's a counterintuitive result. Um, but I would like to look at the sawdust applications. I haven't, since it's an observational study, we couldn't really make sure that it's applied evenly across these two fields. So that would be something to look into um, in the total carbon content of these soils. Um, but yeah, good question. I also would like to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, yeah, if you do have further questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A. Paul can also answer them to you by type as we continue. But now I would like to introduce Dr. Shabtai Bittman. He will be sharing results on nitrous oxide emission from blueberry production um, with precision nutrient management. Um, Shabtai, you can go ahead and share your screen. And I'll just mention that the research he'll be presenting is being carried out by himself, uh, Derek Hunt and uh, Dr. Amy Misiga. Um, who are all research scientists at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Research Station in Agassiz. So welcome Shabtai, go ahead and share your screen and you can start. So thanks very much, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here and to, and to talk to you about the, our project on greenhouse gas emissions and from blueberries. Um, so uh, as uh, Shana just mentioned, we are not part of the UBC Consortium. This is a Ag Canada uh, project that's uh, part of our ongoing uh, work on nitrous and uh, oxide emissions from different uh, uh, sources in the field. So in this particular case, we're interested in the uh, blueberry uh, industry and production of the greenhouse gases from blueberries. And in part, it has to do with the low pH of the soils, which is known to affect denitrification. Um, specifically, our goals were to measure year-round emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, nitrous oxide, uh, methane, and carbon dioxide, as you heard before, uh, from high bush blueberries receiving nitrogen fertilizer using precision uh, fertigation, which means drip irrigation plus dissolved fertilizer. Uh, I'll only be talking about nitrous oxide for lack of time. Uh, determine effects of alternate fertilizing regimes. Uh, so there are uh, different methods that we're looking at. And distinguish between emissions from the fertilizer zones and the grass alleyways, as has been mentioned but I will um, defer the discussion on the grass alleyways. And uh, then finally, to develop emission factors for nitrous oxide emissions, which are necessary for the uh, national inventory. So um, in terms of treatments, there were four. There's the control without, with drip irrigation, but no nitrogen fertilizer. And there is uh, a 
drip irrigation with, fertiga with fertigation, drip line with fertigation, and the drip line is suspended. There's also the drip line buried under the ground, and there's drip line suspended with fertigation and a nitrification inhibitor, uh, DCD. Um, and the purpose of the nitrification inhibitor is to slow down the conversion of uh, ammonium to nitrate. And that would theoretically and frequently in practice has the effect of reducing nitrous oxide emissions. So this is what the uh, field looks like. And uh, the, you can see the chambers and you, you can see the drip irrigation line, the blueberries and the alleyways. And uh, this is a close up, a detail. It shows the underground line on the left and it shows the suspended line on the right. And these are what the chambers look like when they're covered. Uh, so they're placed uh, strategically between the, corn, between the uh, uh, blueberry rows. And uh, this is the sample collection. And uh, these are some of the chambers that are also in the, uh, in the alleyways. So we measure in the wintertime as well, uh, but we can't measure when uh, the temperature goes sub zero. And the reason is that the chambers require a water seal. There's a channel on the perimeter that you may be able to see. And that has to be filled with liquid water. Otherwise you don't get an air seal, an airtight seal and the measurements won't work. So other than when it's frozen, we measure year round. So uh, in terms of results, um, uh, here's a sampling of them. Uh, so this is two years, uh, slightly over two years of measurements in the field. And you can see that in some respects, this matches with what we heard before. In some respects, it does not. Uh, so where it, uh, we see the peaks clearly for all our treatments is uh, in the period of time when uh, just after the application of fertilizer, which is April, about mid-April to mid-May, which is designated here, indicated by the uh, orange dots. Each dot represents an application of uh, 20 uh, kilograms per hectare at, during that fertigation. There's a total of six of them. And the blue uh, represents the, the irrigation that takes place with or without the fertilizer. So you can see that um, there, the peaks definitely coincide uh, with a bit of a delay uh, after the fertilizer application that happens. And here uh, we only, we started after the uh, cessation of the fertilizer, but you can see the leftover effect from the previous uh, uh, fertigation treatments. So um, at, at one thing that you can discern here is that the, uh, malt, the um, DCD, uh, which is a light uh, kind of orangey color here, uh, delays the emissions. So we get these delayed peaks and that's because of that effect that it has of, uh, of slowing or delaying or reducing the, the uh, conversion of ammonium to nitrate. So just uh, finally, uh, the uh, total results, so the total emissions over um, just over two years, uh, we have much lower values than was reported uh, for Delta in the last, in the last talk but I think maybe higher than was reported in the first talk. So uh, basically about three uh, kilograms, this is in grams per hectare of, of nitrate N. So there were different units that I noticed that in the last talk, it was nitrate, not nitrate N. We always report in terms of nitrate N uh, for better or worse. And, uh, and it helps with nitrogen budget calculations. Uh, so we have, um, uh, about uh, three, uh, two, uh, let's say three to four uh, kilograms per hectare of emissions uh, per year. And uh, in terms of emission factors, which is a calculation of the uh, emissions that are caused by the addition of fertilizer. And you can see that uh, the emission factors are between 0.8 uh, and 1.3, which is a little lower, but in a, definitely in the ballpark of the IPCC uh, default values. So we're uh, interestingly right in there. So that's uh, what I have for you today. And uh, of course, questions are welcome. Great, thank you so much, Shabtai. If people have questions for Shabtai, feel free to put them in the q and I'll give you a moment to do that. Um, otherwise you can type them in and we can um, add them to the Q&A after our final presenter. 
So perhaps Shepta, you can stop sharing your screen now and I will introduce our final speaker and then we'll have um, a bit longer time for Q&A. So our last presenter day, today is Dr. Sean Smucker, Associate Professor and Chair of Agriculture Environment in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at UBC Vancouver. Dr. Smuckler will be discussing beneficial management practices for blueberry production to reduce THG emissions and sequester carbon. So um, go ahead, Sean. And Shabtai, there is a question for you, but I think we'll come, at, come to it at the very end. So <laughs> we'll, answer yet. We'll, we'll get to it in a few minutes. Yeah, sure. No, no worries. Thanks, Shabtai. And go ahead, Sean. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Shauna. So I'm going to try to uh, wrap up with the uh, an overview of some of the BMP options for blueberry production uh, here in BC. And I'm gonna present uh, one, one more uh, study, some, some results from one, one more project that we, we did, and then basically do some extrapolations of the BMPs that were presented to uh, the production area in BC to give us a sense of what, what the BMP potential would be in terms of overall emission reductions in the province. But first, I just want to give uh, a context, and you know, I apologize to those of you who were here last week. Uh, some of this is, is a repeat, but I think it's important to, to, to recognize our overall emissions and what our potential is to, to, to re reduce those emissions in the agricultural sector. So here are, are the, the BC agricultural sector emissions in kilotons of CO2 equivalent so that's uh, a thousand tons of co2e or uh, a million kilograms and if we were to say adopt the provincial uh, target of reducing emissions by 40 percent by 40 uh, percent below 2007 uh, uh, emissions by 2030 that would mean that we would be looking for something along the lines of a, a, a thousand kiloton uh, reduction from our 2008, which is somewhere around 3000 kilotons. So what we're looking to do is a rapid, if we are to subscribe to this 40% uh, reduction, we're looking for a rapid uh, reduction to get us to 2030. So that means that you know, while, while the agricultural sector is relatively small in, in British Columbia, uh, this emission target is, is quite ambitious and we will, we will likely need to see most sectors do their part. So in terms of uh, blueberry emissions across the province, using the, uh, the area reported in the last St Statistics Canada survey, there's roughly 14,000 hectares of, of production across the province. And we know that uh, recommended application rates uh, range for blueberries from uh, those that are one year to those that are eight years from 15 kilograms per hectare all the way up to 115 kilograms per hectare. So using a, a median average or an average of, of those and an emissions factor of 1.6, Basically, our blueberry production in the province is a little higher than three kilotons, which is only 0.1% of provincial emissions. So if we were to talk about reducing those emissions, Shopt, I talked about precision nutrient management, otherwise known as 4R nutrient management, the right rate or the right source, the right rate, the right time and the right place. So we did uh, an experiment uh, in an organic blueberry production system at the UBC farm led by a master's student, Kayvon Emig, um, where we looked at uh, blood meal as a broadcast at 90 kilograms per hectare on old new sawdust, but also on, on old sawdust. And then we looked at a, a fertigation approach. This is more along the lines of the precision uh, options that Shoptai was just presenting. And again, on a new sawdust and on an old sawdust. And we wanted to look at the, the relationship between these fertilizers and sawdust because we know that every few years, many producers are putting on uh, sawdust 
and it's actually a, an important source for uh, microbes to utilize the, the, um, the nutrients from the fertilizer and the, the fresh inputs of the carbon from the sawdust. So similar to the other studies, we uh, measured emissions of three gases over uh, two years. And this is a graph similar to what uh, Paula showed earlier. And again, we see that there's a, a pattern in uh, the production season where we have higher CO2. Um, but interestingly, we only see a very large spike in nitrous oxide following the, the first application of fertilizer in the first year. So when we look at the cumulative emissions, we, we see only that first spike on the, the fresh sawdust, the new sawdust from the broadcast blood meal causing the majority of the emissions over the two year period and a very significant difference in the two approaches. So we had uh, three and a half times more emissions with the broadcast application than with the, the fertigation approach. So if we were to think about taking the 4R uh, approach and applying it to the, uh, the area of blueberries across the province, and assuming that, that um, many of the producers are already using this 4R approach, that perhaps we could get uh, another 40% of producers involved, and that the emission reduction factor that we would be observing would be 0.3 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. And then if we were also to include uh, a nitrification inhibitor at uh, double that amount of 0.6 tons per CO, of CO2 uh, E per hectare per year, considering that maybe 70% of the producers could be adopting this, we're looking at uh, an emission reduction at 100% of those producers of uh, not even a, a, a one kiloton reduction. So it's putting a small dent in our overall nitrous oxide contribution. So if we were to think a little bit more about the drainage uh, management that Paula had presented, we don't really actually know how many blueberry farms across the province have drainage issues. Although in 2015, we did a survey of producers in Delta and 76% of them responded uh, that they had considerable uh, drainage issues. So if we took that number and we think about you know, the, the opportunity to apply drainage management improvements and considering the options would be to either uh, it'd be very hard to install new tile drains in an in a existing blueberry field. But in our 2017 analysis, we showed that we had substantial differences in water table by introdu introducing pumps into the system. So it may be that producers uh, who have drains, tile drains now with the addition of of pumps could actually reduce their, their water table and uh, manage their, their soil moisture. Alternatively, we also showed that by cleaning tile drains, we substantially reduced water table uh, in blueberry fields, water table levels in blueberry fields. So these are two options that might be appropriate for uh, producers with existing tile drains to improve their, uh, their uh, water management. And then for producers who are installing new uh, or implementing uh, planting new blueberries, they might consider uh, putting in tile drains from the get go. So again, this, this analysis has lots of assumptions, but if we take that 14,000 hectares of, of production and we anticipate that 76% of the producers are, are having drainage problems and could then implement uh, a drainage management improvement with a 0.8 tons of CO2 uh, reduction per hectare per year, we're looking at again close to a almost one kiloton reduction in, in uh, emissions. So we're, 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 we're chipping away at the, the emissions profile. And then uh, finally, uh, in, a, in a study by uh, Lindsay Dowell, a master's student uh, who graduated last year, 
she quantified the carbon sequestration uh, in woody riparian ve vegetation either as a hedgerow or as a, a riparian buffer. And we can see from her results that there are sizable amounts of carbon stored in the woody vegetation as well as the soils uh, in, in these two farm edge management practices. So if we were to uh, assume that farmers who uh, are currently growing blueberries could plant a, a, a three meter hedgerow, uh, they, we, we anticipated that 95% of the area could, could have additional hedgerows and calculated that of these farms, we could uh, accumulate 194 additional air, uh, hectares of hedgerow at a rate of, uh, at a, a GHG reduction rate of 14.7 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. And at this rate, we could uh, achieve a two point, more than a 2.5 kiloton reduction in uh, emissions, which gets us a lot closer to our, our overall emissions profile. So if we look at the, the, the various options for BMPs relative to our nitrous oxide emissions coming from blueberries. And I'm basically ignoring the, the questions that, that, the important questions that, that Patrick brought up and Paula brought up about the uh, importation of sawdust and the incorporation of, of carbon into the soils. But with these uh, three different options, uh, what we can see is that with 100% adoption across our producers, we could uh, more than offset the nitrous oxide emissions coming from blueberries. But with uh, only a 25% adoption, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the reductions that would be equivalent to 40% of, of uh, a 2030 target. So to conclude, um, our blueberry BMPs are showing promise for reducing emissions, uh, particularly um, our farm edge management options. Uh, the, the analysis that I just went through has huge assumptions. Um, there are large uncertainties that are associated with this. And it's clear that adoption rates are key to any sort of emission reduction factor. And we need to, to work out what, what, what it will take to get farmers to adopt these BMPs. And then we really do need to integrate the, some of the, the, the big unknowns that um, were introdu introduced earlier in terms of this global warming potential analysis, getting a better handle on what happens with, with sawdust getting imported and uh, what happens to these soils over time. Uh, particularly in the, the drain field that's showing that uh, we're uh, the exact opposite of what we would have assumed that a, a, a well-drained field would actually have emitted more carbon dioxide. And certainly we need to do some, some more investigation into the options for drainage management for, for blueberries. And then um, look at ways that we can manage the alleys of these blueberry fields, which are quite a substantial area of, of the production system. And then perhaps look into alternative mulches, particularly if we look at the life cycle analysis and uh, the, the, the emissions uh, reductions that we would gain from using mulch are actually um, negated by the, the transport or the, um, the uh, destruction of the trees. So uh, I'd like to thank all the, the many collaborators, students, and particularly the, uh, the collaborating farmers and the uh, various funders who contributed to this research. And I think I will take questions if we have any time. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, you were some really interesting points there around some of the possibilities as well as importance of adoption and uh, the, the many unknowns. Uh, you made a good case for why further research is needed. Um, I'm going to go back now to a question uh, for Shabtai, and I encourage people to type in questions for Sean or for other presenters into the Q&A. Um, 
I think we can stay a few minutes over. So, you know, feel, please feel free to um, type in your questions. And Shabtai, uh, the question I wanted to pose to you is the one around um, the economics. It, is the addition of DCD economical for farmers? Yeah, good question. Every farmer would want to know that. Uh, probably it's not economical unless there are additional um, funds associated with the reduction of emissions. So that needs to be taken into account. Uh, but uh, there are other uh, considerations. Uh, the, um, yeah, so we, we saw emissions coming in uh, what looked like the winter time. And I wondered if those uh, had to do with, with uh, free, so, so, free thought cycles, which by the way, we didn't see too much of in, the, in these uh, blueberry trials. Uh, but we have seen them with our grass trials, and they are reported elsewhere in the literature, and they can be quite substantial. But for us, it's mainly uh, associated with the uh, application of uh, nitrogen. So there are three factors that um, occur, that in, in three influencing factors uh, that will determine the emissions. And we see that in almost all our trials, and we've had many trials over the years with different types of crops. And so what it is is that... Uh, you get higher emissions with wetter soils. This has been mentioned. You get higher emissions with warmer soils. This was not always mentioned, but it is very true. And with the uh, addition of nitrogen into the system, there are other factors, but those are three big ones. In reality, uh, what makes this complicated is that as the temperature is warming, the soils are drying out. And so, you have uh, three different, and then the fertilizer is overlaid on top of that, depending on when you apply it and over what period of time. So you have three different factors that are kind of moving targets. So one of the possibilities I think that needs, that should be investigated is to apply the fertilizer earlier in the year when the soils are colder. I think if you could do that without hurting the blueberry production, and I don't know that part of it very well, but that could be a way of reducing emissions. Uh, we've seen that in a lot of our trials where uh, our early applications, the emissions are quite low. Um, and even though the soils are very wet and that's because they're so cold. So uh, what you wanna avoid is applying your fertilizer when the soils are warm and wet. This often happens in June, but it can also happen in May. So that, that's what you wanna avoid. I know I, I kind of uh, meandered off uh, the topic, but I thought this would fit in with what a lot of discussion uh, has been about. No, thank you for adding the, those additional comments. That's very uh, on point. Um, Sean, um, I want to direct two questions to you that have been uh, upvoted in our Q&A box. The first is around uh, the cost of these beneficial management practices to industry. Um, and if you think that uh, implementing some of these BMPs would require, require a reduction in production volume, uh, in particular, the use of hedgerows. And this question comes from just observing that you know, many farmers, especially in the lower Fraser Valley, are using all of their arable land for production. So how can we balance the use of hedgerows and um, the cost of production and the need to use as much arable land as possible for just for the economics of farming in, in this region? Yeah, I think that that's a really important question. And I think that for any BMP, I, I think a farmer's decision is often going to go directly to the, the cost benefit analysis. Um, what, what I think we should really consider are the co-benefits of some of these BMPs. So hedgerows, for example, have many ecological uh, co-benefits that actually might not only be beneficial for the environment in general, but also for uh, the blueberry production system as well, as they are valuable uh, habitat for pollinators. So there's actually a team at UBC that's investigating with the Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust, the, uh, the impact of, of hedgerows, hedgerow pollination services on blueberry production. So I think that, that there'll be a really interesting uh, study to look for in the future. But I think we definitely need to consider that, you know, as, as Shopti pointed out, that maybe we, we need to, to recognize that what we're talking about is a societal benefit and that as a society, we need to share the cost with the, the farmers if we want that benefit. 
Thank you, Sean. And I'm going to direct one more question to you, um, and then perhaps we'll wrap up after that. Um, the question is um, around the use of fertilizers. So, and this person posing the question also attended last week's session on vegetable production. And from both of these presentations and the results shared, they were getting the impression that um, many far farmers are perhaps applying fertilizers in excess of crop needs, um, or maybe um, in excess of what should be used on poorly drained soils. So the question is, do you think that, you know, one of the primary issues here is that farmers are um, applying for, uh, nitrogen fertilizers above uh, ministry recommendations? So I, I don't think we have a good sense of whether or not farmers are doing this. And I think if, if we're to use these as realistic emission factors, we have to get a, 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 a uh, a better handle on what farmers are doing with their their fertilizer. Um, we don't we don't track this well in the province. We don't do it uh, at a spatial resolution that can be tracked, and the farmers aren't reporting it. So we don't we don't we don't know. Okay. Well, maybe I will just add one more question here before we wrap up. And this is an you know another topic that seems to come up often is around uh, biochar and amended soils. Um, and I think I'll let any, anyone here uh, jump in on this one if they'd like to. So here's, here's the question. So conventional soil has high concentrations of soil organic carbon um, to about eight inches. Using uh, biochar amended soils with a probiotic treatment, you can get uh, you know, over 80 inches deep of soil organic carbon. So this would you, um, theoretically make the soil 10 times more effective at drawing down carbon. Do you think this is practical to use this type of biochar amended soil with blueberries? No, no one wants to take it. Huh? I mean, I, I wonder about the, um, the possibility of using biochar as a mulch. I think it's really hard to incorporate into a, 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 an, an existing uh, blueberry field very deep into to the soil, maybe in the alleyways. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of life cycle analysis uh, work that needs to be done before we we determine that the biochar is going to be an effective sink for for CO2. Well, thank you, Sean, for uh, being willing to take that question on. OK, well, there are still a couple of questions, um, but I think I will have the presenters follow up with those. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you to all the presenters for the research you're doing and um, when you have final publications or other places where the results are available, um, we can share those out with everyone that has registered today. We also have recorded the session, so we will be sharing that and um, as well as the, the recording from last week. So once again, thank you everyone and thank you to everyone for making the time to join us today.